Hello. Today, what we want to do is to develop linear algebra, or at least basics of linear algebra, for vector spaces over an arbitrary field. Okay, so let's start with why we care about this and it's a bit of connection with our course before we get to the definition of a vector space over a field. We have proved some, some results of this type, something like this, that for instance, if F is a field, if I look at a monic polynomial of degree N, then uh, with coefficients inside the field F, uh, then every element of the quotient ring F bracket X modeled by the ideal generated by F can be uniquely written as an F linear combination of elements, the cosets that are represented by one, x, x squared, x to power n minus one. So we have this kind of description of linear combinations with coefficients inside this field f, and every element can be uniquely written as such an f linear combination. We have seen similar statement when we added an algebraic element alpha to a base field f. And then we got f bracket alpha and we showed that every element inside this new field can be uniquely written, again, uniquely written as an f linear combination of one alpha, alpha to power n minus one. So again, we have a similar kind of description, bunch of elements and every other element can be uniquely written as an F linear combination of these elements. Okay, so this has a similarity with uh, what you've seen in linear algebra. And there you see that every element can be uniquely written as an R linear combination of the standard basis. So that motivates us to study how much of the linear algebra that you've, you've learned about vector spaces or real or complex numbers can be extended to an arbitrary field. Or maybe later, um, we want to relax the condition of F being a field at all. But we'll see that the uh, F being a field actually plays an important role uh, for many of the proofs. Okay, so let's start with uh, definition of a vector space over a field. So F is a field, that's our, our assumption. I give you a set V, then this set V is called a vector space over this field F if it has the following properties. First of all, V has an operation plus, and with respect to this plus op operation, it's supposed to be an abelian group. It's supposed to has a zero, Every element is supposed to have a negative and um, the usual properties of abelian groups being associative and so on. Moreover, we want to have a scalar multiplication, which means what? For a given pair of elements, one of them belonging to the field F, the other one inside the vector space V, we should be able to talk about C times V. And that's supposed to be another element of the vector space. So not only we have addition, but we also have this scalar multiplication. Now, what are the possibility? I mean, what are the main properties of the scalar multiplication? So it's essentially the distribution properties. So if I give you C1 and C2 inside the field, and when I give you an arbitrary element V inside the vector space, when I multiply C1 plus C2 by V, it should be the same as multiplying C1 by V and then adding it to the product of C2 by V. Similarly, if I give you an element C inside the field and I give you two vectors, V1 and V2 inside the vector space, when I multiply V1 plus V2 by C, it is the same as C times V1 plus C times V2. So it's similar to what we have seen before some examples are like this, that you take the vector space, uh, you take the field F, and then you multiply this by itself n times. So F cross F cross F, we sometimes write this as 
f to power n. And that means I'm considering the n tuple of elements from the field f. Then this set as an abelian group, and we have already seen that this guy does have an abelian group structure by just adding component wise. And um, now we can define a new scalar product by multiplying C by each one of the components separately. So we define C dot A1 dot dot AN to be C times A1 dot dot C times AN. So this way one can easily check that this forms a vector space over F. Now, another important example, especially for this course, is the following, that if A is a ring, and I tell you it has a subring, that's this field F, so F can be embedded into A. In that case, I can view A as a vector space over F. So A is already a, a ring, so it, it does have a billion group structure. So what is important for me to check is uh, the scalar product. I have to first define what it is, and then I have to check why we have the needed distribution properties. So for an element C inside the field and an element A inside the ring, I have to tell you what is the scalar multiplication of C by A. What I observe is that F is a sub ring of A. That means I can simply multiply C by A in the ring A. So C dot A, I'm going to define it to be C times A, where this, this right hand side is simply multiplication in the ring A. And now, because A is a ring, we do have the distribution properties, which means I can distribute A by C1 plus C2, and simply, and, and the other way around, C can be distributed uh, in A1 plus A2. So using these distribution properties, we do get that this is indeed a scalar multiplication, and then therefore A is a vector space over the field F. This is an, this is, uh, a good part of linear algebra that we need for this course is uh, based on this example. Okay, but uh, let's recall some of the basic properties and one, some of the basic concepts in uh, linear algebra. Um, so one of them is the concept of linear independence. So what is it? Uh, we say uh, a few vectors, V1, da, 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 Vn, these vectors inside the vector space V. We say these are F linearly independent if they do not satisfy a non-trivial linear, linear relation. What does that mean? It means that if I tell you a linear combination of the i's is zero, then all the coefficients should be zero. In that case, we say they are linearly independent. Otherwise, we say they are linearly dependent. So otherwise, we say, otherwise, we say they are linearly independent. F linearly dependent. Now, when I give you a bunch of vectors v1 to the dot vn inside the vector space, we say they spam the entire vector space. We say the eyes spans, span v um, if every element of this vector space can be written as an F linear combination of VIs. What does that mean? This means that what is F linear combination means, that means every element inside the vector space can be written uh, of the form C sub I VI for some C sub I's inside the field F. So this means F linear combination. 
Now, let's also define what is an F basis of a vector space. An ordered set of vectors, because it's ordered, I put it in parentheses to emphasize that they are ordered. An ordered set of vectors, v1 to the dot vn, is called an F basis of v if, first of all, they are linearly independent, F linearly independent, and second, they span the entire field, no, the entire vector space V. So both they are linearly independent and they span the entire V. And if we have such a such a case, then we say um, they these vectors, this ordered set of vectors, form an F basis of V. Whenever, so we've mentioned this before, whenever we see a new concept in uh, mathematics, we should ask ourselves, what can we say about its substructures? And what can we say about the maps that preserve uh, the structure or the properties of this object? So let's start with substructure. Uh, and let's say, uh, let's assume V is, a, v is a vector space over a field uh, F then a subset W of V is called a subspace if, first of all, it is closed under addition, and second, it is closed under scalar multiplication. So, um, instead of saying closed under addition, we could have also said it's a subgroup of V and a deep subgroup. And then, uh, and it is closed under scalar multiplication. So, uh, for instance, if I give you a vector space V, and uh, and, and I give you V one the the V and inside this vector space, the smallest subspace of V, which contains V sub i's is going to be the set of all the F linear combinations of the eyes. So if I consider the set of all the F linear combinations of the eyes, clearly any subspace that contains the eyes would contain these because any subspace is closed under a scalar multiplication. So they should contain C sub i times B sub i. And they are closed under addition. Therefore, they should contain some of these terms. So clearly, any subspace that contains V sub i's would contain this set as a subset. But this set itself is a subspace because when I add two elements of this type, I'm going to get another element of this type. And when I multiply it by some scalar, then using the distribution property, I get another F linear combination of V sub i's. So um, this argument quickly shows that this is indeed the smallest subspace of V that contains V1 dot Vn. We denote this subspace by span of V1 dot Vn. And we say that this is the subspace spanned by the eyes. Okay, so. Now let's go to the maps that preserve the main property of this structure. This is not something new. We have seen this before. These are exactly linear maps. Or when we want to emphasize what the field is, we call it F linear map. So suppose V1 and V2 are two F vector spaces, vector spaces over F. Sometimes we call them F vector spaces. Then a function t from v1 to v2 is called an f linear map or f linear is called f linear function or linear map. We say it is f linear if uh, it preserves both addition and scalar multiplication. So, or I can put them together and say if I have this equality. or sometimes it's useful to have them separately. So alternatively, I can write down that it preserves addition. And it preserves a scalar multiplication. 
So both ways are okay. So why are these things uh, equivalent? Is essentially based on the fact that zero times V is zero and anything times the zero vector is also zero. You can show these uh, results similar to what we showed in rings using distribution property. So uh, I put a question mark here and you guys think about these equalities in a vector space. So if you have such a map, then we call it a linear or F linear uh, function. We say a function T from V1 to V2 is an isomorphism of vector spaces or F vector spaces. If first of all, T is an F linear map, T is a bijection and therefore it has an inverse. And the inverse is also an F linear map. One thing that it's rather easy, but I will not show it and I leave it to you, is to show that the third part is not needed. In fact, the first two parts imply the third part. If I already know that T is F linear and it is bijective, then the inverse map is automatically F linear. But I wanted to mention this because this is the correct way of defining isomorphisms between um, two objects in mathematics. So whenever we see, so I give you two objects in mathematics, no matter what the objects are, a map between them is called an isomorphism if uh, it is it has an inverse and the inverse and the map itself, both of them preserve properties of that object. Okay, in any case, uh, let's uh, move on. So we, in, in this course, we are going to treat this as redundancy. And whenever we want to show something is an isomorphism, we just show, when we're, whenever we want to show that uh, T is an isomorphism between um, two vector spaces, we are going to show that T is linear and it is a bijective map. So, I leave this as an exercise for you guys that the inverse would be automatically an isomorph, uh, a linear map. For instance, from here we can, uh, I mean, from basics, just laying down the definitions, we can automatically see that uh, any uh, vector space with a finite set of, uh, with a basis that has finitely many vectors in it, is automatically isomorphic to f to the n as a vector space for some n. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the proof. It, the proof is rather easy. You've seen it before, but uh, it's a good exercise to see um, this statement. Okay, so let me. So suppose v one. Ah, suppose v one. Da 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 v n. This is an ordered set. And it's an F basis of the vector space B. Then, for every vector small v inside this vector space, um, there is a unique vector c1 dot dot cn inside F to the n, such that v can be written as this F linear combination of vi's with coefficients c sub i's. So, essentially, again, let, let me repeat what this statement says. It says that every vector inside this vector space V has, can be uniquely written as an F linear combination of V sub i's. You see, I mean, that was kind of our first motivation to go into the um, vector spaces over a field. Because at the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that when we add alpha, an algebraic element, to a base field F, then every element of f bracket alpha can be written um, unique can be uniquely written as an f linear combination of one alpha da, 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 alpha to power n minus one, where n is the degree of the minimal polynomial of alpha. So you see that and that uh, that is similar to saying that one da, 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 alpha to power n minus one is an f basis of uh, f bracket alpha. 
So we'll come back to this example later, but I just wanted to point out the connection between this um, property of um, F bases and uh, the example that we have already seen uh, in ring theory and field theory. Okay, so if B is a basis, then every vector V can be uniquely written as this F linear combination. And this gives us a map from V to F to the N. And the map simply sends V to these coordinates, to these um, coefficients, C sub I's, the way that we can write it as linear combination. So we denote these, this n tuple with this v square bracket sub b to emphasize that this uh, n tuple actually depends on the choice of the basis b. Now, now that we have this map, our claim is that this map is indeed a vector space isomorphism. And therefore, every vector space with a finite set of bases is isomorphic to f to the n as a vector space. Okay, so let's go through the proof. Why, uh, why is it the case that uh, uh, knowing that B1, V1 that the dot Vn is a basis, uh, why can it be, you know, why do we have the uniqueness of the way that we can write down an arbitrary vector V as an F linear combination in our Vi's? So let's start with the existence. Because B spans the entire vector space V, we know that every vector V can be uniquely, can be written as an F linear combination of V sub i's. So we already get the existence. So we definitely do have some C sub i's um, such that sigma C sub i V sub i uh, is B. Now, Let's examine the uniqueness. So suppose that I've managed to write down a vector in two different ways. So meaning uh, I have C1, V1, plus C2, V2, the dot, dot C and V N, and this happens to be the same as sigma C sub i prime V sub i's. Now I want to argue why C sub i is the same as C sub i prime for every i. So I bring one side to the other, and I get that this linear combination of V sub i's is zero. But by assumption, V sub i's are F linearly independent. So this star implies that um, all the coefficients should be zero, because again, V sub i's are linearly independent. Therefore, C sub one minus C sub one prime, C sub two minus C sub two prime, and so on, all of them are zero. And that means all the C sub i's are equal, which means this these two n tuples are in fact the same. So this shows the uniqueness. Therefore, this is a well-defined map that sends V to this n tuple. Now the claim, we want to show that it is in fact um, uh, a bijection. Um, we notice that it has an inverse map. If I give you an n tuple, uh, of vectors inside uh, F, then I can simply consider the uh, F linear combination of V sub i's with coefficient C sub i's. And that would be by definition inverse of the map that sends V to square bracket V. Therefore, that's a bijection. So, so far we showed that it's a well-defined bijection. To finish the proof, it's enough to show that this map preserves addition and it preserves the scalar multiplication. So suppose that I give you V1 and V and V prime and C and C prime, and then I consider a uh, square bracket of V and let this guy to be A sub I's and the square bracket of V prime, let this be A sub I primes. And then um, that means what? That means a V is this F linear combination of the basis V sub I. And V prime is this F linear combination of the basis V sub I. These primes are not needed. Okay, so that's my V and V prime. Now, what do I want to do? I want to look at CV plus CV prime. Because I want to show that this map is linear 
So I'm taking this linear combination of V and V prime, and I want to see where this vector is mapped to. By looking at the definition, uh, I mean, by looking at the summations that we have, so this is a sigma A sub I, V sub I, and this one is sigma A sub I prime V sub I. So I plug them in and then distribute, and I get that it is sigma C A sub I plus C prime A sub I prime the whole thing times v sub i. So this means the coefficient of v sub i here now is c a i plus c prime a sub i prime. So c a sub i plus c prime a sub i prime. So that means that's the coefficient, the i -th component of this vector, which means this vector is this. And now we can simply factor out these are c's and c primes and get that um, our vector is the linear combination of a sub i, the vector a sub i and the vector a sub i prime and that's exactly what we wanted to get. So this map is a bijective map which is linear and therefore it's an isomorphism of vector spaces. Now we get to the heart, I mean, one of the important results of um, linear algebra, which tells us that we can actually talk about um, a basis. Uh, okay, we can actually talk about a dimension of a vector space. Uh, so what, what is that? So an important result in linear algebra is the fact that um, uh, if I give you two bases of a vector space and I tell you that um, one of them has cardinality n, the other one has cardinality n, then we can deduce that n is equals to n. And we cannot, I mean, and we should also argue that uh, under what condition uh, V does have a basis. And uh, again, as part of this. Uh, technology is that if V can be spanned by finitely many vectors, then uh, we can always find a basis among them. In fact, if, if a vector space is spanned by finitely many vectors, then we can throw out some of these vectors and um, get, if I consider maximal set of vectors that are F linearly independent among these V sub i's, then that set forms a basis for the vector space. So what I'm saying is that uh, what I want to show next is that if I give you two bases, then uh, they have the same cardinality. And that cardinality would just depend on the vector space V and we call it the dimension of this vector space. To show this result, we are going to prove that every set that spans V should have at least as many elements as the number of vectors that you can find that are linearly independent. So the vectors that span, they should be at least as amount of the vectors that you can find and they are linearly independent. This is a result that we want to show. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, the the statement and the proof and so on. Let's start with the statement again. So V is a vector space. Um, now I'm giving you two sequences of uh, vectors inside this vector space. The first set uh, consists of vectors V sub i's that span, v, that span the vector space. So the F span of V sub i's is the entire vector space V. The next set and the next sequence of vectors consists of f linearly independent vectors. So w sub i's are f linearly independent and v sub i's span the entire set v. In that case, we want to prove that n should be at least n. Okay, let's, uh, let's see why this is the case. So what we will do, so I'm going to describe a system where uh, what I will do is that I'm going to replace one of the V sub i's by one of the W sub i's 
and make sure that still I am going to span the entire view. So again, what is the process? And let's repeat. I start with v1 at the dot vn. Then I take w1. I say, I should be able to drop one of the vi's, replace it by this w sub i, and the span v, still a span v. Then I take w sub 2, drop one of the remaining v sub i's, and still span v. So I continue like that. So I'm going to produce a, a sequence of indices, i1, i2, i3, and so on. And at step k, I'm going to switch the i sub k vector from v sub i's, from v sub j's, with w sub k. After switching, I make sure that they still span the entire vector space v. And these indices i sub 1 dot 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 i sub m are going to be distinct. In particular, that implies that I have m distinct indices from 1 to n. And therefore, n should be at least m. And I get the desired inequality. OK, so again, let's repeat. I'm going to produce um, inductively. I'm going to produce a, a distinct set of indices, i1 dot dot, dot i m. So these are going to be distinct indices with the following property, that the f span of the vectors, so I'm going to take vi's, drop out v sub i1, v sub i2, v sub ik, and put instead w sub 1, w sub 2, w sub k. So again, what we are doing, we are replacing w, we are replacing v sub i j, uh, we are substituting w sub j for v sub i j. So we are, or we are replacing v sub i j by w sub j. So we are substituting. We are substituting W sub j for V sub ij in, in this set. And um, so we are doing it in a way that uh, we still make sure that uh, we are spanning the vector space V. OK, so for the base case, when k is actually 0, I, we don't need to do anything, because in that case, uh, we already have that v1 dot dot vn spans uh, the entire vector space v essentially by this property that we have over here. So by the star condition, this condition, we already know that v sub 1 dot dot v sub n uh, spans um, span uh, the vector space v, and that gives us the base case, k equals to zero. Now, suppose that I have already found these indices i1 dot 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 ik, distinct indexes, indices i1 dot 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 and ik, with the property that uh, when I substitute w sub j's for uh, these um, particular indices, I can still span the vector space v. Now I want to uh, find out another index, i sub k plus 1, and replace this vector by w sub k plus 1 and still span the vector space v. OK, first thing first is that uh, because I want to simplify my notation, my life a bit, so what we'll do is that uh, we um, replace v sub i's, change their indices a bit, and make sure that these i1 dot dot i k are actually 1 to k. Okay, so I can rearrange v sub j's and assume that uh, i1 is just 1, i2 is just 2, and i sub k is just k. OK, so this means the induction hypothesis tells me that the span of w1, w2, wk, and the rest of the v sub i's is the entire vector space. Okay. Next, what I do, I look at w sub k plus 1. I know 
that it can be written as an F linear combination of these vectors, W sub one dot dot K, ah. it can be written as an F linear combination of W one dot dot W K and V sub K plus one dot dot V sub K. That means what? That means this W sub K plus one can be written as an F linear combination of W sub one dot dot W sub K and V sub K plus one dot dot V sub N. Okay, um, now, the first claim, the first step is to show that one of these, one of these coefficients are going to be non-zero. So again, the claim is that there exists some j, that's at least k plus one, one of these coefficients of v sub, the, the remaining v sub j's, one of those guys should be non-zero. Okay, why is that the case? Suppose to the contrary that this is not, this is not the case. So these C sub K plus one, C sub K plus two, and so, so on till C sub N, all of them are zero. That means what? That means W sub K plus one is indeed an, an F linear combination of W sub one to the W sub K. But that's not possible because if I have such a thing, I end up getting an F linear combination of W sub I's that is zero. And this F linear combination is a non-trivial one because this coefficient is not zero. This coefficient is actually negative one. It is not a zero coefficient. So we are getting a non-trivial F linear combination of W sub i and that's zero that contradicts the assumption that F linear, that W sub i's are F linearly independent. So because of this contradiction, we deduce that uh, at least one of these uh, coefficient of V sub i's cannot be zero. So that gives us the first claim. Now again, by rearranging the terms, I can assume that this, uh, this coefficient that's not zero is in fact the K plus one coefficient. It's not needed, this rearranging, but it helps uh, with our notation. So suppose that C sub K plus one is a non-zero coefficient. Now our claim is that in that case, I can replace a V sub K plus one by W sub K plus one, or I can substitute W sub K plus one for V sub K plus one and still span the entire vector space B. So our claim is that the span of W sub one, W sub two, da, 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 W sub K, essentially I'm just, replacing V sub K plus one by W sub K plus one. And then I don't touch the rest. And the claim is that this guy still expands the entire vector space. Again, notice because we already know that when I start with W i's till W sub K, and then, I, when I, then from V sub K plus one till by V sub N, because these guys span the entire vector space V, to show this claim, it would be enough to argue why the K plus one V is already inside the span of W one dot dot W sub K plus one and V sub K plus two dot dot V sub. Because if V sub K plus one is here, then the rest of these vectors are also here. You see, these guys are already here. These ones are there. The only vector that's replaced is this one. So if we have changed V sub K plus one and put, it, put down W sub K plus one instead of that. So if we manage to show that V sub K plus one is already an, an F linear combination of these vectors, then we get that V sub K plus one is inside this space Therefore, the F linear combination of those things are going to give me the entire vector space. Okay, so why is that the case? Remember, we have this property that uh, we have over here. The W sub K plus one has been written 
as a linear combination of w1 dot the dot w sub k and v sub k plus one dot the dot v sub n and we assume the coefficient of v sub k plus one is not zero here is the crucial part that f being a field is going to be used so again because of the equation that we had the double star i can bring w sub k to the other side and isolate the, the term involving v sub k plus one. So the term that involves v sub k plus one is this. So c sub k plus one times v sub k plus one is an F linear combination of w y's and w sub k plus one, w one the w sub k and w sub k plus one and v sub k plus two till the end. So we end up getting linear combination of these vectors. And using them, I, we, can write, we can get C sub k plus one times V sub k plus one. Now, C sub k plus one is not zero. That's why we isolated this term. F is a field. And therefore, the inverse, and therefore this is a unit. I can talk about inverse of this F. The, here is the crucial part. Here is the part that we are using the hypothesis that F is a field in a crucial way. If F was not a field and still we had a scalar multiplication and so on, we could not necessarily divide out or multiply both sides by the inverse of this scalar multiplication. So that's uh, the place um, that we are using the fact that F is a field. Now, just remember that I forgot to put in this condition and uh, I will put it in the lecture notes, make sure that this is the case, that we have to also make sure that one times V is always V for every V inside the vector space. And therefore, when I multiply both sides by the inverse of this C sub K plus one, I get the vector v sub k plus one. So what I'm saying is that in the definition of vector space, I had to also include this, that um, this is scalar multiplication over here. So we put two distribution properties and we need this third property one times V is V. Okay, so um, the, the rest goes through, it's, it's okay. So let's continue. So um, now because F is a field, C sub K plus one is a unit that I can, therefore I can multiply both sides by the inverse of C sub K plus one. From here I deduce that V sub K plus one is in fact an F linear combination of W sub one, W sub K, W sub K plus one, V sub K plus two and V sub N. That means it belongs to the span of W sub one, W sub K plus one, V sub K plus two and V sub N. So we managed to replace W, to replace V sub K plus one by W sub K plus one and we did not lose V sub K plus one because it is still in the span of these new vectors. And so uh, this new span is still the entire vector space V. This completes our process. So we managed to find a process and replace one of the VIs by a new W sub J and so on and continue it like that. And uh, because this process is possible, that means we have at least as many uh, B's that we have W's and therefore M is less than or equal to N. That's exactly what we wanted to get. From here, I immediately get the well-definedness and of the concept of dimension. So suppose that V is a vector space and it is a spanned by a finite set. So a span of this finite set V1 dot dot VN, 
is the entire vector space B. That's our assumption. Then definitely I do have some F bases. And in fact, I have an F basis as a subset of this set that you have given me. In particular, I have an F basis that's finite. Second, if I tell you that uh, there are two F bases, WIs and WI primes, then they, then they should have the same cardinality, the same size. This size, the size of an order uh, of a basis of a vector space is called the dimension of this vector space. And sometimes we want to emphasize what the field is. We say dimension of V over the field F and we write it as dim sub F of the vector space V. Okay, so let's prove this. So suppose, uh, first I want to show the existence of a basis. So I take a maximal subset of V sub i's that, are, that consists of F linearly independent vectors. So this is a subset of V sub i's. It consists of F linearly independent vectors. So this means that these vectors are F linearly independent. And this word maximal here means that when I, am, I cannot add anything else to it. So any other vector that I add, I end up getting a set that's linearly dependent. Okay, so let's see what it means. Every J that you give me, it's not among these indices that I've already picked. This set is supposed to be F linearly dependent. And that means they should satisfy a non-trivial non linear, linear equation. That means there should be some coefficients where not all of them are zero inside the field F, where C sub one times V sub I one, C sub two times V sub I two, C sub M times V sub I M, C sub M plus one times V sub J is zero. And at least one, at least one of these coefficients is not zero. Now, first we say that this coefficient that's not zero, I mean, C sub M plus one can, should be that one. What do I mean by that? C sub M plus one cannot be zero. So let, let's start with this. So if C sub M plus one was actually zero, if it was zero, then what does it mean? This means C sub one times V sub I one, C sub M times V sub I M, this summation is actually zero. But by assumption, these vectors, these ones are F linearly independent. So because these vectors are F linearly independent, what do I deduce? I mean, if I know that this linear combination is also zero, I should deduce that all the coefficients are zero. Then all the CIs are zero. C sub M plus one, we have already assumed that it is zero. Then all the coefficients are zero, but that contradicts our assumption that at least some of one of these uh, C sub L so is not zero. So that means C sub M plus one is not zero. Again, because F is a field, that implies that it, it is a unit, so it has an inverse. Therefore, I can multiply both sides by the inverse of this constant. One times any vector is the vector. So that means V sub J is this F linear combination of V sub I1, V sub I sub M and so on. That means no matter what J I pick outside of this indices, it will be inside the span of this um, set of maximal independent uh, sub, sub, uh, vectors. That implies that the span of the entire V sub J's is still a subset of a span of this uh, set consisting in this subset of maximal independent vectors um, a maximal subset of independent vectors uh, of V sub i's. 
Therefore, the span of these vectors is the entire vector space. Okay, so so far we showed that they are they are spanning the entire vector space, and the way that we chose them, they are linearly independent. So altogether, I'm getting that this is an ordered set uh, that that are linearly independent and span the entire vector space. That means that's the basis of this vector space. Okay, that shows part one. Now suppose I give you two bases, one of them WIs, the other one WI primes. Because WIs span the entire vector space and W sub I primes are F linearly independent by the theorem that we proved, M should be at least K. The number of uh, vectors that span V should be at least the number of vectors that are linearly independent. Now, because W sub I primes span the entire vector space and VIs, WIs, not VIs, WIs are linearly independent, we deduce that M cannot be more than K. So altogether, we get the equality, and that brings us the definition of dimension of a vector space. Now, let's bring in a bit more, in, a bit more advanced uh, concepts into the concept of vector spaces over a field. Uh, suppose that V is a vector space and W is a subspace. Then in particular, W is an additive subgroup of V. So I can look at the quotient of V by W. So this quotient is an abelian group automatically. Now I'm going to define a scalar multiplication on this quotient. So what is the scalar multiplication? I take any element inside the field. I pick a coset that's represented by V. And I define C dot this coset to be the coset that's represented by C times B. Now, my claim is that it is a well-defined scalar multiplication. And this scalar multiplication makes this quotient into a vector space over the field F. OK, so uh, let's see why it is well-defined. I give you two cosets. I assume that they are the same cosets. That's equivalent to say. And V1 minus V2, the difference of these coset representatives, should belong to the subgroup W. Now I multiply both sides by C. I notice that because W is a subspace, it is closed under a scalar multiplication. So C times V1 minus V2 is still inside W. That means I distribute. That means C times V1 minus C times V2 is still inside W. That implies that they are giving me the same cosets which means this is a, indeed a well-defined scalar multiplication. Now let's see why it is a, why it is a vector space. Let's uh, check the uh, distribution properties. Uh, I'm going to write down one of them. So C times uh, cosets that are represented by V1 and V2. I use the, the way that we are adding two cosets, essentially by adding the coset representatives. Then I use the definition of a scalar multiplication by multiplying C by the representative. Uh, then um, I use the distribution for uh, scalar multiplication inside the vector space V. Then again, I use the definition of summation in the quotient, quotient subgroups and definition of a scalar multiplication. So we get that we have the distribution property. As you can see, it is rather straightforward. Similarly, you can check uh, the other distribution, this time uh, C1 plus C2 dot uh, a coset. You can easily check that this is the case. And similarly, you can check that 1 dot uh, V plus W is 1 times V plus W, but 1 times V is V. So we get this property as well. So we have all the properties of um, a scalar multiplication, and therefore, this is indeed a vector space. So the quotient, uh, now we can talk about quotient of a vector space by uh, a subspace. Similar to the additive groups, and so not necessarily additive, any groups, and uh, similar to um, mudding out a ring by an ideal, we can talk about the natural quotient, ma quotient map. So uh, the natural quotient map, 
is here and we are using it in the additive group setting. So we send a vector V to the coset that's represented by V. Then uh, by definition of a scalar multiplication, one can easily check that it is indeed an F linear map. And from additive groups, we already know that the kernel of this map is not zero, but rather is W. Let me see what I have, right? So the kernel is precisely W. I mean, these things we know from additive group that uh, kernel of the natural quotient map is uh, the subgroup that we are modding out by. And uh, the fact that it is F linear is straightforward, one can check it. We already know that it is an additive group homomorphism. The scalar multiplication comes from the way that we are defining this is scalar multiplication. Okay, so now um, the nice thing about this quotient map and quotient of a vector space by a subspace is that uh, it satisfies this additive dimension property. What do I mean by that? So we have that dimension of a subspace plus dimension of the quotient space is equal to the dimension of the vec uh, vector space V itself. Okay, let's see why this is the case. I give you a basis for W, let's call them W sub i's. I give you a basis for the quotient space of V by W, let's call them V sub i's. So suppose that I have M elements in the first basis and K elements in the next basis. By definition of dimension, that means dimension of W over F is M and dimension of V over W over F is K, okay? So uh, what we will show is that if I put them together and consider W1 to the dot WM, and v1 to the dot v sub k, all together, they give us an f basis of the vector space v. If we show this, that implies that dimension of this vector space is m plus k, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. m plus k, dimension of w over f, dimension of v over w over f. So that's exactly what we want to show. So we are going to do this in two steps. The first step to show that the span of these vectors is the entire V. And next, we are going to show that they are linearly independent. So let's take the span of these vectors. And I want to argue that that's equal to V. Let's call the span W prime. So W prime is a subspace of V. OK. Now, what we know for sure is because w1, w to do da, 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 w sub m, they are elements of w prime, the span of them should be a subspace of w. But the span of wi's is w. So w is a subspace of w. Therefore, I can mod out w prime by w, and I get that w prime over w is a subspace of v over w. Okay, but this subspace W prime over W, this subspace also contains cosets that are represented by V sub i's. So it does contain V sub i plus W sub j's. I mean, V sub i plus W i's, V sub i plus W. So, but these vectors, the span of these vectors is the entire v over w, which means w prime over w is indeed the entire v over w. Now, either we can use the correspondence theorem for subgroups of quotient. So I'm looking at the quotient of v over w, and I'm telling you that there is a sub subgroup whose quotient is giving me the entire quotient. So either you can use the correspondence theorem for subgroups of the quotient groups, and deduce the W prime should be the entire V. Or you can repeat this part of the argument and say, okay, what does that mean? I give you an element inside the vector space. It is inside this quotient. Okay, that means it is inside W prime over W, which means I can find some vector W prime inside this vector space so that the coset represented by V is the same as the coset represented by W prime. That's equivalent to saying that, uh, that's equivalent to saying, stop. 
sorry, that is equivalent to saying that V minus W prime is inside W, which is the same as saying V can be written as something inside W prime plus something inside W. But W is a subspace of W prime. Altogether, we get that V is inside W prime. So no matter what vector I give you inside V, we, it turns out that it is inside W prime, therefore W prime is the entire V. So this shows a step one. So the span of W1 da, 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 WM and V1 da, 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 V sub K is the entire vector. Now let's see why they are linearly independent. I take a linear combination of them, C sub I is inside F. I assume that this linear combination is zero. I have to show all the coefficients are zero. So I take, uh, I take the quotient, natural quotient map, mod out by W. So that's the natural quotient map. Because these guys are inside the kernel, these are inside W, when I mod out by W, they are killed. They are in the kernel. So they are zero. That means I end up getting that the linear combination of these guys is going to be zero. So C sub M plus one, the coset that's given by V sub one plus C sub M plus two, the coset that's given by V sub two plus and so on, times uh, C sub M plus K, the coset that's given by V sub K, this ends up being zero inside the quotient space V modeled by W. But by our assumption, V sub J plus Ws are F linearly independent. So this equality, implies all the coefficients should be zero, which means all the coefficients of V sub i's are zero. Okay, now I put them back inside this and I deduce that, uh, and to use the fact that these guys are zero, so I deduce that the linear combination of W sub i's now should be zero, but W sub i's are F linearly independent. And that means all these coefficients are also zero all together we get all the coefficients are zero, which means these vectors are F linearly independent. So by step one, they span the entire vector space. By step two, they are F linearly independent. Therefore, they are, uh, they form a basis of this space. Therefore, the dimension of this space is the number of vectors that I see over here, which is M plus K. M was the dimension of W. K is the dimension of the quotient space. and we get the desired design. Now we finish the linear algebra part by proving the nullity theorem. Uh, so suppose I give you two vector spaces, V1 and V2, and I give you an F linear map from V1 to V2. So that's an F linear map. So image of F is a subspace. That's part of the claim, kernel of F is a subspace of domain. So image is a subspace of codomain. Kernel is a subspace of domain. Then similar to group theory and uh, ring theory, we have the following isomorphism, but this time for vector spaces. So F bar that goes from the quotient of domain by the kernel is isomorphic to the image of F and what is F bar? F bar sends the coset that's represented by V1 to F of V1. So that's how we define F bar. Then this is a well-defined isomorphism of vector spaces. So this is an isomorphism of vector spaces. In particular, they have the same dimension. Based on the dimension, we can deduce the dimension of kernel of F is plus the dimension of image of F is equal to the dimension of domain. So you can think about it like a conservation law. So when I start with V1, I apply F to this, some parts might be killed, but some parts will survive. They add up to what, I, what we started with. Okay, so let's start with why image and kernel are subspaces. Because F is an additive group homomorphism, we already know that image and kernel, both of them are subgroups, additive groups. So it's enough to focus 
and why they are closed under scalar multiplication. So suppose V2 is in the image. That means V2 is F of something in the domain. I multiply it by some scalar. So C times V2 is going to be C times F of V1. But F is a linear map. So it preserves a scalar multiplication. So it is the same as F of C times V1. That means it belongs to the image of F. OK, so it means it, the image of F is indeed closed under a scalar multiplication, and therefore it's a subspace. Now let's see why kernel is a subspace. I pick uh, V2 inside the kernel. That means F of V2 is 0. I multiply both sides by this is scalar c, so I get c times f of v2 is c times 0, therefore it is 0. So again, we, we have point this, pointed this out that anything times the 0 vector is 0, and 0 times anything, uh, any vector is 0, and the argument is similar to what we have seen in ring theory based on distribution properties. That means uh, because f is a linear map, it preserves a scalar multiplication. Therefore, f of c times v1 is 0. Therefore, c times v1 is in the kernel. So altogether, we get that image and kernel. Both of them are subspaces. Now, um, because f is an additive group uh, homomorphism, we already know by the first isomorphism theorem for groups that f bar is indeed a well-defined group isomorphism. In particular, it preserves addition and it is a bijection. So it's a well-defined group isomorphism. So it's, it preserves addition and it is a bijection. So to show the claim, it would be enough to show that f bar preserves scalar multiplication. So I pick some element inside the domain, which means a coset that's represented by v1, and I pick, it as, pick a scalar c then f bar of c times this coset is, what does a scalar multiplication mean? It means I have to multiply c by this coset representative. Okay, so I have to understand what is f bar of this coset. But f bar of a coset is f of the coset representative. f is a linear map, so that's the same as c times f of v1. Again, that's by definition f bar of the coset that's represented by v1. So altogether, we get that f bar does indeed preserve a scalar multiplication. Therefore, it's an isomorphism of vector spaces. Now, um, because it's an isomorphism, dimension of the image is isomorphic to the dimension of this quotient space. But the dimension of quotient space is the difference of the dimension of numerator uh, minus dimension of the denominator. Now, if I bring dimension of the kernel to the other side, we get the nullity theorem. So in the next lecture, we will see how we can use um, linear algebra in the context of field theory.